Monarch, Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. But if you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch, Legacy of Monsters. Streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. This episode is brought to you by Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Some things are just better together. Like party playlists and Friday nights. Campfires and ghost stories. Peanut butter and chocolate. And Reese's Cups are the perfect combination of creamy peanut butter and delicious milk chocolate. So, when you want something sweet, you can't do better than Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. Buy Reese's today wherever candy is sold. Hey, I'm Jamie Glowacki, and you are listening to Oh Crap, I Love My Toddler, But Holy Fuck. This is a podcast for conscious parents who drop the F-bomb a lot. All right, so we have talked about boundaries. We've talked about your boundaries. We've talked about psycho mom. And these kind of all, these three episodes sort of all go hand in hand, right? Because now I want to talk about boundaries with your kids. And I actually am calling this episode emotional emotional swaddling, okay? And there's a reason for that. So we swaddle babies, right? We know now that swaddling, So tightly wrapping them makes them secure and safe, right? Because what happens if we don't swaddle them? They flail. They hit their own damn faces. They have no idea where their limbs are and they flail and it feels very unsafe, especially after coming out of the womb where they were tightly packed, right? So now we know that physical swaddling makes the child feel really good, really safe. You guys, boundaries are emotional swaddling, okay? They do the same thing for the psyche. They keep your child tightly wrapped because that makes them feel safe. And I think this is one of the most confusing aspects that I work with with parents, the not understanding boundaries with their kids. We have to go back to that model that I talked about in the introduction right? Which is zero to six years old is govern. Six to 12 is garden. 12 to 18 is guide. You cannot guide a zero to six-year-old. They will flail. And I have come to look at it. It's like a new sort of crazy on the playground. I can see it a mile away in person and I can hear it miles away over the phone. These kids have, um, what's that book? A jungle book. The, er, the first rendition of the Jungle Book movie, there was the snake, I think it is, who has these like hypnotic round eyes. And that's what I see in kids without boundaries eyes. They are free falling through life. With all the parenting philosophies and everything that's out there, we have this idea or this idea exists that, you know, children can make good decisions, that children, if we just leave them be, they'll actually make really good decisions for themselves Oh my God, you guys, no, no, no. They have no, almost no development in their frontal lobes. They have, their limbic systems aren't developed. Their executive function isn't developed. They really won't make good decisions on their own. And so we need boundaries. And again, when we were talking about your personal boundaries, boundaries with our kids can feel really mean, especially if you grew up in a house with two stringent boundaries. If you grew up with somebody who was power hungry, who came down on you for every little infraction, okay? You need to heal that shit, really. You need to heal that wound so you can parent effectively now because good boundaries make your child feel developmentally safe. They cannot be expected to not have rules and to figure this shit out on their own. You cannot expect that of them. It is coming, I promise, I promise, I promise. If you lay this groundwork now, it is coming and you will have this pleasurable experience with your child in that gardening phase is so rich and delicious and that guiding. But for right now, it has to be all boundaries, all governing all day long. So when, I, when I'm working with a family, I find that the notion of boundaries does get really mucked up. And I think it's worth talking about why it gets so mucked up, why it's such a hard time for a lot of parents to set and maintain firm boundaries. I think one of the main things is, you know, 
let's be honest, your heart is now walking around outside of your body. You have this high emotional attachment that I, you know, I sitting here, you know, on air don't have with your child. It's very easy for outside observers to say, you know, well, blah, 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 you should just this, you know. I was just working with a client who, you know, she's working on bedtime boundaries. And it just so happens that her little one is um, has a nasty cold, a stomach ache, and she sucks her thumb and her thumb got cut. So her thumb's bleeding. So she doesn't have the ability to self-soothe. And the mom was, the mom's pretty great about the, the boundaries, but we were communicating. I was like, oh, now's not the time to have the good boundary. Now's the time to lean in a little with that super tenderness, right? Because, you know, the, the mom was feeling so bad. And of course, you know, there are going to be times where we don't want to hold a really strict boundary, but she had that high emotional attachment. She called me because she was so unsure. She was like, oh my God, what do I do? I want to really hold this boundary, but I can't. And so we have that emotional attachment that sometimes we have to honor. And sometimes we have to look and say, attachment or no, I've got to hold this boundary. Yeah. We have a lot of confusion. <laughs> what makes a psychopath? And I can't tell you the amount of clients who talk to me and say, you know, I'm just, I'm afraid I'm raising a psychopath or I don't want to set a boundary because he's pushing against it and I don't want to raise a psychopath. Keeping boundaries is actually going to help your child developmentally, psychologically, and help you not raise a psychopath. In fact, I'd venture to say that there, there are kids you know, either with too stringent boundaries or no boundaries at all that don't necessarily make a psychopath, but really can impede development and get huge reactions out of your child. Another big problem we have right now, you guys, is a desire to have our children like us. I'm here to tell you, your child does not have to like you. They really don't, not in this zero to six years when you're laying all this groundwork, you will have amazing, beautiful connection, communication, with your child as they grow, if you can maintain the boundaries now. This is something I see super consistently. I see it in my own community and I see it in my professional life is parents don't want to do this work now, right? It feels mean. They don't want to, they, it feels yucky. They don't want to set the boundaries now. I don't need to do use any discipline. I don't need to have consequences. I don't need any of this. They're just, they're little, they're tiny. I don't need to think about these things right now. Then when the child is six to 12, they're kind of maniacs. And now you have to attend to it. And now you're punishing and you're taking away devices and you're grounding them, taking away activities, fighting. You guys, if you lay this groundwork now, you won't have to do it later. It sticks. And so those boundaries become so important. Those rules and being really firm that happens now, and then you won't have to do it again, right? I hope that makes sense to you. We also have a misunderstanding that boundaries are, that the kids should test boundaries with other kids, but that when you lay down a rule, it's going to stick and, and your kid's going to have no problem with it. Yeah, that's not going to happen at all. <laughs> so, And especially at this age. And this, this is, I've talked about this before. This is this main difference between two years old and three years old. And I've said it in other episodes, what might seem cute and learning and, and easy at two, at three, four, and five is not. And what I find is that most parents won't set the boundary because you feel like, oh, there's no difference between two and three. Whereas psychologically and developmentally, there's a huge difference. And if you don't set your expectations and keep those boundaries firm in that age range, you get screwed later on. And it's hard. It's hard disciplining an older kid. It's way easier when you're at this this age where your child's development is, is sort of malleable. And that's where you want to come in and set these rules and expectations and hold them. Now, I've talked a lot about, right, this like setting the rules and governing, and it can sound really harsh. And I hope you guys know in my work that I am all about a gentle, loving communication between you and your child. And so setting the rules and expectations does not have to be mean. And in fact, it's just, again, so much easier if you start out this way. So then it's not like you're switching the game on your child. When I'm trying to explain this to a parent who has weak boundaries, I say, listen, it's like a fence, okay? It's like a fence in your yard. And why do we put up a fence? We put up a fence because you know your child's not gonna make a good decision if they fly out 
the back door and they have absolutely no fence, no rule keeping them inside. Do you think your three-year-old, when you say, honey, you need to stay, you can't go farther than that tree and there's no fence there. Your three-year-old is not going to make a good choice. Your three-year-old is going to run to discover the world because it's new and exciting. Let me go towards the road. They don't understand that they could get hit by a car and die. They don't understand that that dog could attack them. No, it's all new and they want to explore. They can't be faulted for that, right? So we put up a fence and that is what we do to contain them. Now, if you've got a wild spirited child, that child might kick up against the fence. They want out. Something's got to be better on the other side if my mom's keeping me inside, right? They might kick against the fence. But what's going to happen is eventually they'll say, huh, well, I can't get out. Oh, I guess I'll play with the things in here like that Superfly swing set on that sandbox or this really cool truck. They will start to discover the stuff inside. That is the same thing as the psyche. There's going to be tons of moments where your child's going to kick that fence. I want out. I want different things. You know, I want more TV. I want junk food. I want candy. I want these things. Give them to me. They're testing you. That's the classic limit testing, right? They're going to test your boundary to see if you will move it. And far too many parents think that moment is where to move the boundary. Oh no, he was he was really bucking against me. I just I just moved an inch. Oh, that's the danger. I've said it before. If you give them an inch, they'll take a yard. So it's your job to stay as that fence post, kickable, scream atable. They can do all their boundary pushing, but you aren't budging. Yeah. So that's how boundaries relate. And again, it's about this. It's the rules. It's the rules and the expectations. Just like your personal boundaries, your rules and expectations are going to have to be clear and repeated often. Even the ones that you're like, duh, oh my God, I say this every day. How can you not know this is the rule? Even if every, you know, bedtime is the same every night and your child kicks against it every night. No, that doesn't mean you move the boundary. It doesn't mean you take the boundary away. It means you repeat the same thing over and over again. I work with parents a lot on this. This comes up both in potty training and in parenting is if we start saying different things, if we start trying different tricks, if we start doing all these things and running ourselves ragged, trying to please the child, what that smells like is fear. Your kid's going to eat you like a piranha and spit out the bones if you smell like fear, right? Because if you're not in charge, they think they have to be in charge. And so that is a dangerous place to be. (laughs) You just... You don't want to negotiate. You don't want to try different things. There's immense safety in repetition and consistency. That's what this age needs. Oh, I know that you would like to stay up. I hear you loud and clear. And you know what? Bedtime is 730. So let's go. It's time to take a bath. Same thing. Every single night, you will have to repeat it. And that's okay. Because you have to repeat it does not mean you're a bad parent. It means you're holding the boundary. Monarch Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. If you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch Legacy of Monsters, streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. The other thing about boundaries that I find, people are expecting absolute logic to work with their three or four-year-old, right? They logic their way. Well, you know, if you don't go to bed now, you're going to be tired in the morning and it's going to be hard for mommy to get to work because you're going to be tired and not be able to find your shoes. Holy shit, you guys, your kids don't have logic. Stop trying to apply logic to a toddler. It just doesn't work. They don't have the long-term thinking. They don't give a rat's ass about your day. So if you're trying to set a boundary that makes your life easier, your kid doesn't care. So stop trying to convince them that they should care about your life. They're too little. Now's not the time. You can do that when they're 12. Then they, then they, you can talk about how they need to do certain things to make your life easier, but not now. It's, I see parents do that all the time. And then you're trying to convince a three-year-old. Guys, you don't need permission from your three-year-old. 
You're the boss. It's okay for you to be the boss. You can be loving and gentle and firm at the same time. So that's, a, the, parents don't understand that, that if you're firm, and we talked about this with Psycho Mom, right? With three different voices. If you say something and you mean business, you're not being mean. You are the boss and you get to be the boss. You know why? You've been on the planet longer. You know more. So you should be the boss. The three-year-old should not be the boss. And in fact, one of the biggest things I know when I get on the phone with a client for the first time and I hear these words, they drive me bananas. Oh, she won't let me. No, no, she won't let me. She won't let me have a dinner at the dining room table. Yeah, she doesn't let me sit down. If you find yourself saying the words, she won't let me. Yeah, you have weak boundaries and you need to fix that. Now, of course, there are certain things, you know, like if your child's hair is very tangly and she won't let you brush it. Of course, there are things that we do, you know, oh, my baby won't let me take him out to a really nice dinner. Yeah, when our kids are little, they probably won't let you sit through a three-hour Philharmonic orchestra show, right? There's that kind of won't let me or I can't do that right now, right? My kid won't let me work out. I, it's not, I'm not able to do that right now because my child is at a certain point in their life where they need me more. There's that. But if your child is actually controlling your behavior, you must stop it. You must set better boundaries. Yeah, they can't handle that kind of power. And that is power. You're giving them power. So if your child's directing who can say goodnight to them, who can't, who's going to go to the potty with them, who's going to read, if they're directing in any sense like that, very, very weak boundaries. So we've talked about this and boundaries are the rules. So let's talk a, a little bit more practical stuff. One thing I find is that parents start to learn how to set boundaries and then they choose the wrong things. I'd say a lot of my work with my parent coaching is like, what hill do you want to die on? They're really... If you don't want to be this authoritarian parent, right, you have to let some things go. So you want to pick your battles. And I know we all know that, but really dig deep. What are your rules that have zero negotiation, right? Zero. I would say for me in my work with clients, and therefore I suggest it for you, although you don't ever have to do anything I say, bedtime. Bedtime absolutely should be a non-negotiable Knowing, of course, that there's vacations, there's staying at grandma's, there's situations where bedtime will be later, of course, because it's life. But bedtime should really be a hard and fast rule with zero negotiation. Where and when to eat, that might be a certain, you know, hard and fast rule for you. Uh, that's less for me. But there's, you know, choose choose your battles. You can't hold super strict boundaries. You will end up creating the, probably the thing you don't want, right? You don't, we don't want to squash our children. We don't want to squash their spirits. We don't want to like everywhere they turn, there's a freaking rule and a, a fence and no child's going to be happy in a fence. That's, you know, four feet by four feet. So we want to give their psyche emotional room to grow. But at the same time, you know, make, I, I always say, make some non-negotiables. And, and I talk about this in my potty training work, right? There are certain times that are non-negotiable. You pee before you get in the car period. That's a non-negotiable. Just like you don't drive away in a car without the car seat being buckled, right? And, and when parents get mucky about boundaries, I use the car seat example because that's a really good example to me of what a non-negotiable looks like. We have all put our knee to the chest of a screaming, flailing child to get that seatbelt buckled so that we can drive away to wherever we need to. We've all done it. So that's a boundary that you will not, not negotiate. And so you are capable of doing that, right? I don't know anybody who will drive away and say, you know what? It's cool. You don't want to buckle today. That's all right. We don't do that. So again, the stakes are high. So we set that boundary. And that's, uh, to me, that's a really good example because it shows that you know, is your child afraid? Did you did you screw up your kid and raise a sociopath? The next time you get in the car, did your child shriek and, and be, were they traumatized because you did that to them before? No, they get in the car seat and they're fine. So it's another good example of, of let go of the fear that you're traumatizing your kid by by being firm with boundaries. I hear that all the time. Like, I don't, I don't want them to need therapy later because I was so mean. Guys, that's not mean, right? You're, that's safety. So I use that a lot. 
this becomes all the boundary stuff becomes super important between the age of two and three. So I really want you to think about that. And even if you've hit me and my work a little late in the game and your child's four or five, just dive right in. This this work is super important. Again, you're laying the foundation for a gorgeous childhood to follow this. And I feel like there's this real misunderstanding, again, with that zero to six governed, six to 12 garden, 12 to 18 guide. I've got so many parents trying to guide, trying to talk to their three-year-old and convince them that their logic makes sense and that they should care about mommy and daddy. And it doesn't work. You just want to be like really simple. Your kids are black and white thinkers right now, and it behooves you to be a black and white thinker with them. The good stuff is coming. The, that, the stuff that you're looking for, and I do find that most parents are looking for this wonderful, wonderful relationship with their child, right? And it's not exactly that you want your child to love you. I think you're looking, I mean, like you, you're looking for this communication. We're all looking to parent this beautiful communication-wise way where we're open and honest and it's lovely. You're going to get that. I promise you, you're going to get that. Remember that toddlers, give them an inch, they take a yard. They're power hungry little things that they can't help it because they're figuring out the rules. They really are. And so if you teach them one thing, they're going to say, oh, okay, I can, you know, this is negotiable. I can work with this. And it's not malicious. It's not even clearly articulated thoughts. It's just them learning the ways of the world. They're learning the ways of your house, learning your expectations, learning what is negotiable, what isn't. All right. Now, of course, once a boundary is, is crossed, <laughs> what happens? How do you stay firm? How do you stay firm when that child is super reacting? Right. And that is where discipline comes in. That's where we have to take other measures. Right. Now, I don't want to get into discipline in this episode. I'm trying to keep all my episodes, you guys, very doable for you. I know. I, as a busy mom, appreciate a 20 to 30 minute podcast. So I'm trying to do that in in turn because I know your time is limited. And of course, discipline is a huge issue and topic. So I'm not going to talk too much about that. But I will say one quick thing about discipline, which is you really need a lot less of it than you think if you simply follow through with your action. So if you set a boundary and your child crosses it, There has to be an action, whether it's a natural consequence or an external consequence that you've made up. A real big one is, you know, set the boundary of no, you can't have candy in the supermarket when we're shopping. And so your little one throws a fit for candy and you let them have the candy, right? They crossed a boundary and they threw that fit and they were not respectful of the boundary. And of course they're not. They're two or three, they're not going to be respectful of the boundary. They're going to push. So if you give them the candy, you have just told them that it's really not a boundary, that they can throw a fit and get the candy and take all the emotion out of it, right? There's no emotion attached. They've just learned if I want this, I do this and that's how I get it, right? However, if you, you know, set the expectation, hey, we're going to go into the market. You are not getting candy. Please don't ask me for candy. If you throw a fit, we're going to leave. You set the expectation, right? That's key, 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 key in boundaries. You have to set the expectation. You have to let your child know what you expect from them. Then they still throw the fit for candy. You take that child and you leave the market. You follow through with the thing you said, I can guarantee it will not happen again. It will only happen again if you don't follow through with the thing you said. So what's the big trick in here? Setting up the expectation. If you do this, this is what will happen. You now give your child a little emotional room to make a good decision. They don't make a good decision because they're two, three, four years old, and they're not going to make good decisions all the time. That's okay. You follow through with what you said. I can guarantee you will have to do a lot less disciplining than you ever imagined possible. If you can set that expectation with a consequence, be very clear what the expectation is, what the consequence will be, and follow through. And it's not always easy. I understand that it's not always easy to leave the market with a full basket of of groceries, but it's so worth it because you won't have to do it again. And so that's where a lot of trouble comes in where you have to discipline is because you yourself 
let your boundary get pushed, 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 pushed. And at some point, you're going to react. Psycho mom might come out, right? That is where psycho mom makes an, uh, an appearance a lot of the times because you let the boundary be pushed. And so you can't do that. When we do the follow through, how many times? Holy shit, have you been in a restaurant and you hear a kid in a family next to you? If you do that one more time, we're leaving. No, no, no. I told you not to throw that French fry. If you do that one more time, we're leaving. I said, we're leaving. We're going to leave. Sometimes I want to go grab the kid and say, leave, leave, please. (laughs) It's an empty threat, right? If you say it more than once, it's an empty threat and your child knows that. So follow through becomes the, I just, I can't overstate it. It becomes the issue. And again, you will just not have the discipline as much as you think you might. Follow through with what you say, set the expectation, set the consequence. Oh, but that's another thing, right? Is parents don't want to set the consequence. And it, they, that feels mean to them. That, guys, there's natural consequences. Dude, if you're a crazy lady screaming on the floor of the grocery store, the police are going to come and take you away as a grown up, right? So it's not an unreasonable natural consequence that if you're going to throw a fit, we're leaving. That's That's not unheard of, right? And more importantly for us, the parents... You just got to get out of the store anyway, because the mom shaming that's going to happen because your kid's falling out, you know that somebody's going to film that shit and put it up on Facebook. You go viral. That that shit happens. So get your kid out of that store ASAP anyway, because (laughs) you don't have the mental fortitude for the looks and the shit you're going to get from people in that store. So it serves two purposes, really. But we like I said, we'll talk a lot more about this because there's tons more to say on that. All right. I'm going to sign off for today. You can always go to jamieglowacki.com for the super cool latest updates, including the launch of my new book, yummy new book pre-sale treats, when we release new episodes, and how to work with me directly. And of course, if you need any potty training help, there's a handy link there that will take you to all my potty training resources, including all my courses. That's the Oh Crap Potty Training online course, my pooping solutions course, and my night training supplement. And if you need additional help, how to book with a certified OCRAP consultant. That's all at jamieglowacki.com. Have a beautiful day and rock on.